Hey everybody, it's Greg Rice. We're here in Providence, Rhode Island, and we're with Mr. Stephen Palumbo. Gregory, how are you? Awesome. Of Stephen Palumbo Entertainment. And today we're going to sit down with Steve, who is a three-decade veteran of the entertainment industry. That's right. Here in Rhode Island. Yeah. So Steve, how did you get started? Wow, that's like the million dollar question. It is. I'm coming in hot. Whew. How much time do we have? All day. <laughs> So I started when I was 10 years old, singing in church, um, St. Pius Church, right around the corner from here with my mom. And you know, dad would attend. But mom and I always sang during mass and during you know the congregation and whatnot. So at a certain point, we decided to join the church choir, just kind of on a whim, 10 years old. That led to getting involved in my elementary school choir and then joining a boys choir that was modeled after the Vienna Boys Choir in Europe. And from there, I got involved in opera when I was like 11, singing at the Ocean State Theater. Um, and uh, continued it kind of casually through college. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated college, that's when I decided to pursue singing professionally and you know, try to make a business out of it. And uh, professionally, what was, uh, in your mind, the professional kind of bar? Like, were you going with a group? Were you going solo? What was your kind of uh, your setup? Right. So when I graduated college, my, my initial goal was to get involved with a group. So professional entertainment to me looked like joining like a musical vocal band, like a group. Right. That was working a lot, local venues, and I did just that. And what was that group? So the group was called Twice. And T how do you spell that? T-W-Y-C-E. A lot of people ask. Yeah. A lot of people who know ask that question. Twi and who is in the group? So it was myself, there was uh, the late, great Manny Barrows, who hired me, rest in peace, Manny. There was Michael Vincent Davis, rest in peace, and there was uh, Frank Reese. And how old were these guys, and how old were you when you joined? Right, so at the time, about 1993, I had just turned 22. Okay. And I think the next youngest guy was like 40. Wow. Maybe 42. And how did they give you like that? that, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That rite of passage to join this group of men, like double your age. How did you kind of get in? Did they see you perform somewhere else? Did they have you come and audition in front of them? Like, how did they say, all right, this, this kid is good? Right, I just told a really dear friend of mine this exact story. And in a nutshell, I was kind of knocking on doors, seeing who was looking for a vocalist to kind of get my foot in the door and get my chops and you know sharpen my skills as a vocalist, as an entertainer. So I was pretty much going at it blindly. And the more I got my name out doing auditions, I came across a guy named Vinny Vento and he liked my voice, but he couldn't use me because at the time I couldn't play an instrument, right? Uh -huh, okay. He said, but I'll keep your name and number. So if something comes up, I'll share your contact info and see what happens. So I'm thinking, Mr. Skeptic at the time, I'm like, yeah, okay. We'll see. So lo and behold, I got a phone call from Manny Barrows yep. from Twice and said, we got your name from Vinny. We want you to come down to the Coast Guard house in Narragansett and audition for us. Wow. I said, great. I've seen them on TV. Yeah. And I've actually seen them out, you know, perform live at the time. And uh, they asked me to prepare two songs to sing, you know, for the audition in front of like a live kind of audience. Okay. So one song was um, Luther Vandross. Here and Now, and the other one was On the Wings of Love by Jeffrey Osborne. So I'm sitting in the, the restaurant, the Coast Guard house, waiting to get called up, and these guys are killing it, you know. Doing so they're their, doing their trio. They're doing their quartet, actually. Oh, they're, okay. I was going to be replacing their fourth guy. Ah, okay. Right? Got it. Just as they're um, about to call me up, Jeffrey Osborne walks in the door. I'm about to sing a Jeffrey Osborne song, and Jeffrey Osborne walks in the door. I mean, Providence born and raised, <laughs> living legend, international the, the superstar. Golf classic, right? Exactly. Is it related? Exactly. Yep. So I had a scratch on the wings of love. Couldn't do that song because obviously <laughs> he was going to do it, <laughs> which he did. And he completely like destroyed it, brought the house down. So I switched it up and I did a different song and the audience really enjoyed it. And then they asked me to go on that following, that was a Friday night. On the following Sunday, they had me go to a, a club on North Main Street called Snubs. Yeah. And, um... A little different demographic and just to kind of get the comparison between the two audiences yeah. reactions and lo and behold I, I passed with flying colors and gave a good performance and 
was with those guys for like seven years. Wow. Got to perform with some really cool, interesting people. What's the difference between audiences today and audiences when you started? So when I started, I mean... And tell me about, not to cut you off, but get into like their attention, mm -hmm. the eye contact, the body language, like what you notice as a performer today versus then. Right, that's a great question. So I go straight to technology. Back then, and it seems like just yesterday, but 1993 through like, you know, 99, 2000 when I was with these guys, technology was still in its like prenatal kind of stages with regard to what we have today, right? right? We had cell phones, but you couldn't text. There was no social media and no distractions. I mean, it was simply taken and making phone calls. Whereas people, when they came out to a venue to watch us perform, they were there, to, they knew what they were going to see. They knew that they were escaping from, you know, the daily grind right. and the nine to five and whatnot. And they were gonna be entertained. They wanted to dance, listen to music, eat, drink, the whole nine that goes along with, you know, entertainment, socializing. And they were totally focused on our performance. And it was like crazy appreciation, applause, constant participation, people were like involved. Whereas now, people are still as enthusiastic and as involved. Um, but on the, on the downside with technology, there's much more distraction. Mm. You know, if people, if you lose people for a second, oh, exactly. Yeah. Steve sounds good, doesn't he? Right. Oh, oh, I love this song. I missed it. Can I do it again? I was texting. Oh, wait. Right. Let me take a picture. You know, which is great. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's great. So that's the downside, the distraction part. But the upside is that this whole new world of exposure yes. has opened up. Just like here. Man, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a love-hate relationship with technology, right? Because... The distraction, it can, you're constantly looking at your phone, seeing who likes your stuff, you know, seeing who commented, seeing who shared. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good when someone who you don't know right. sees your face, hears your voice, and is like, wow, sounds pretty good. It could yeah. lead to a private party, it could lead to a wedding, Absolutely. you know, a restaurant. It's, that's where like, the business kind of comes in, so it's been sure. real good for business. So what about back in the day, how did you get business? Was it all word of mouth or was it like you were a resident at XYZ restaurants right. or venues? Like how did you how did you expand your web? It seems like it would be harder than today. You know, in retrospect, it, it does seem like it was harder. Only because we were limited. We like ignorance is bliss. We didn't really know what we were missing, right? But back then it was all it, it was a concerted effort among the four the four of us in this group that I sang with. We had paper calendars that we just made copies of and just handed out at our gigs. Mm -hmm. um, we did have uh, residencies. We were at the Coast Guard House every Friday and Saturday for like five years straight, every New Year's Eve, every 4th of July, every holiday weekend. We were also at a place downtown called Tribeca, mm. which is now the Art Bar. And that was one of our favorite gigs, Chestnut Street. Mm -hmm. It's like a jazz room and yeah. real intimate and, and real cozy spot. And we filled it up two nights a week and that was another spot. But in terms of, of getting the word out, majority was word of mouth. In addition to people seeing us at a venue where we performed live. Um, business cards, then and now, still very, very effective. Which is a great way to network and to kind of, you know, share your contact. And how about the toll that it took on you? working every New Year's, working every Saturday, every Friday, every holiday. What toll did that take on you since those are big days for maybe you to spend with your family or you to hang out with your friends. Your weekends are almost weekdays when you're in this business. That's very true. I mean, my Friday and Saturdays were my Mondays and Tuesdays because right. we worked Wednesday through Sunday. You know, we worked a lot. And some weeks we worked six nights a week. Um, it didn't, at the time, it didn't really phase me. You know, I was so young and it was exciting. It was a great experience for me to be so young with these older guys right. and to be, you know, traveling a little bit and performing and, and sharing this great music and meeting people. Um, part of me did miss, you know, holidays and special occasions and, and things of that nature, but I enjoyed it so much that I didn't really think about it a whole lot. Right. I was like, cool, New Year's Eve, like my family was going to be there anyways. 
So it's kind of like we're celebrating together, but just at my place of work mm -hmm. kind of thing. And your charisma, right? That's my favorite thing about you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Your charisma of all... I'm trying to hide it. <laughs> I've met so many people in my life. I mean, I'm only 29. I'm very young. Can't believe it. But I've met thousands and thousands of people. Definitely. Your charisma is organic. It's heartfelt. It's empathetic. It's all the things that it... It should be. Thank you. And it's not phony. No. I don't, in a million years, would ever see you forcing something. It's always like from the heart. Definitely. How did you nurture that? Was that something that you grew up with from your folks or just being in the business? Like, how did you polish that skill? Well, I was always raised to be a kind person, you know, treat people with respect and courtesy. Um, you know, even people who are not so polite and courteous as hard as that is. And as we get older, we get more jaded and we, you know, learn to have tougher skin and, and deal with them in a different manner. But um, it, it had to do with my upbringing. My mom and dad always instilled kindness and gratitude and humility, you know. So when I interact with someone, especially in a professional setting, I always try to make them feel better from having spoken with me, if you will without blowing smoke, without being overly complimentary, right. you know, um, it, it shows respect and courtesy in a conversation. That's how I, I live my life and how I present myself to ask someone about them, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to talking about me. Great. You know, I have an interesting life and I do, yeah. you know, cool things and the music business, the entertainment industry, et cetera, things that I do of that nature. Great. But, you know, tell me about you. Like, I want to make you feel like I value Yes. What's behind Gregory mm -hmm. or whoever I'm speaking with. And mm -hmm. it's, that's not an act. I'm genuinely interested. Yeah. But by the same token, it shows, you know, sort of uh, um, like a, a respect kind of thing, an appreciation for, for someone, mm -hmm. showing them value, making them feel valuable. I remember one moment specifically. It was at, a, I think it was at Parma. In, what is that, Johnston there? It's, uh, it's actually Smithfield, Smithfield. Just outside of Johnston, yeah. Um, you were Parma. performing. Yeah. And you walked up to a table of some older folks and there was a high top table. Okay. So you walked up and you went to put your arm down and you did like the like, <laughs> like I missed, missed like a table. swivel miss. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and I remember just seeing that second of time because I was at the table eating dinner thinking, nailed it. You nailed it. You wow. broke into a table of six, eight people, which is hard. It can be hard. Like to you know, Break that it's ice, loud, yeah. and everybody's drinking, it's, how do you garner that? And you just walked in. Like, <laughs> You're very observant. I didn't think anybody, but anyone besides the people at that table noticed that. Oh, I noticed. <laughs> and you almost, you know, you humbled yourself. Exactly. You came from being the star of the show, and then you, you made it look like you fell. Exactly. You went from here to there, and you didn't care. You're not too proud. You're not too... No, no. And I love that. That yeah. one moment. Wow. It was that was last. I think it was last August. I think it was, you guys. It, it came up on my calendar, like from Facebook to the memory. Oh I, right, I right. took the photo of you. It was like a year ago in three days. Oh my gosh! You would with Delish, Avicoli, Lance. That was a great night. Yep. That was a real good night, and I remember that moment with that table. It's just this, like you know, I, I had no problem like being self-deprecating and kind of like yes. letting someone have a laugh at my expense. Yep. You know, it's good to be confident. And a little cocky, but more more confident and humble than cocky. Yes. You know, because some people don't know how to temper both those, you know, sort of mediums. Mm -hmm. They go a little bit too much, too far one way. Oh yeah. You know, but it's laugh at me. It, you have to you have to be <laughs> humble to a certain extent to perform in and of itself. Because if you hit a bad note, if you're not wearing the right thing, or whatever the case may be, like you know, people are gonna look at you and say, you know, who's this guy? Right. We'll just chew up here. I hope he's, he's in the sun, all right? You know, you kind of, you're taking a risk by putting yourself out there. Sure. I love doing that every time. And you're on the spotlight. Yeah. Is that nervous when you walk out and start your first song or, or say that first note? Is that is that tough for you still or is it just like... So it's not tough for me anymore. It's a lot easier. It's like, you know, putting on like your most comfortable pair of jeans. But... um I, I do still get butterflies, like right before I'm about to go on. Yeah, that little feeling. Yeah, and I like that, you know, because it keeps you 
true to mm -hmm. your craft mm -hmm. and it, like you respect it, you appreciate it and you value it, you know, and that just, it's a good feeling. I don't ever want to lose like those little bit of like anxious butterflies just before you go on, whether I'm singing at a birthday party or a restaurant or in front of a thousand people, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Let me ask you this. What was your most um, unique event? Like you got called and they said, hey, Steve, we want you to come perform here. And you're like, okay, but that's not normal. Right. What was that? Um, there's a couple. One is a place in Boston in Faneuil Hall uh -huh. called Dick's Last Resort. Yeah. Restaurant? It, it's a restaurant. It's one of the anchor restaurants, right, in Faneuil Hall in Boston. And they called and they wanted, this is years ago, I'm talking like 12 years ago, they wanted a Dean Martin guy to sing in Dick's Last Resort. I had no idea what the place was about. And I thought it was a really cool establishment, a cool concept. But I just didn't see where Dean Martin fit <laughs> this place. Yeah. Because what I learned immediately was that as soon as a table of, of people sit down for dinner, the, the server comes over, throws a handful of straws at them, says something rude, gives them all paper hats, writes something vulgar on them with a Sharpie, something mm -hmm. about like Viagra or Geritol or yep. whatever the case may be. And I'm over here singing Dean Martin music, which is some of the coolest, you know, classiest music right. in our American music history. But it paid well. And that's where you kind of trade off. Um, I don't want to say your integrity, but you can't always play at the most ideal places that are, that are perfectly suited for you. Right. You got to adapt a little bit. Yep. And sometimes when the money is, is that good. Why not? You know what I mean? It was just under 500 bucks for like a two hour gig years ago so i kind of put a couple of my principles aside and jumped in how about this right um dj delicious our good friend michael mancini what's up michael he, miss um, you buddy he's a great guy love him I, I met him on craigslist i thought he was the craigslist killer he said meet me at the back of dunkin donuts on plainfield pike i remember i remember I that like, i'm meeting you at dunkin donuts if you pipe in the back, like, does he have a van with curtains too? Right. I didn't know. <laughs> so I showed up, I met him, Robin Ann was there. I met Robin Ann. Oh, I didn't know she was there. She was in the car waiting. All right. And Michael had a velour jumpsuit. Of course he did. With the Kango hat. Yes. Backwards. Some people wear it forwards, he wears it backwards. Michael wears it backwards. And um, that was my first introduction into the entertainment I didn't even really know it existed. Like right. I've been around DJs and bands, mm -hmm. but it's a it's a real nucleus. So I start working with Mike, and I see that folks hire bands, they hire singers, they hire DJs. What do you think for folks at home that maybe want to have their own event is the best way to decide which type of entertainment they want, or if they should have all three or two of the three? Like, what's your suggestion? Now, when you say two to three, do you mean like a singer or a DJ or a band? Like sometimes we work with you and you would open up cocktail hour for yeah. an hour and then Michael and I would DJ the rest of the night. Got it. Personally, I thought that was a good mix. I agree. So what's your suggestion of folks at home that are kind of like, what should I do? Who mm. should I hire? Well, there are a couple of factors that are involved with that decision. First of all is budget, you know, especially nowadays with the way the economy has been and people don't really have that disposable income the way that we used to, for obvious reasons. Um, depends on, on what they want to spend, A, right? B, it depends on their musical tastes and what they want their party or event to sound like, mm -hmm. right? You know, what, what they want it to look like is one thing, the theme, etc. but what they want the music to be. Um, also, who their guests are going to be, what their taste might be, because you don't want to have, you know, a Sinatra guy or a Dean Martin guy at a sweet 16 right unless they bring someone like me in to do say the first hour for the adult kind of portion right. and then bring in someone like dj delicious to do you know the party the dance part right right um for the most part though the stuff that 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 i present the stuff that i sing caters to a wide wide listening audience because i can go from 
Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Billy Joel, Barry White, um, Ed Sheeran. Which I've seen you do. Great. Oh, you have? You did, um, what's that song? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. My mom Love still perfect. talks about that. Does she really? And she talks about you doing Louis Armstrong. Because that was her birthday, right? Yes. If you could give her a couple notes of that wonderful world right now, that would be great. Is that is that something we could do? Put me on the spot. Butterflies. I don't uh -oh. want to. <laughs> Mrs. Rice, this is for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful birthday, girl. Hope you're doing great. That'll be better next time, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. She still talks about that. Does she really? To this day. Well, I love your son like a brother, so hope to see you guys soon. And uh, if I'm out there again in the near future, please come out and hear me perform. Say hello to Mr. Rice. And what about now with everything going on? What's your take on the future of going out and performing? Are you nervous about it? Do you think it's going to bounce back with a vengeance? Mm. Do you think there's a, a pent-up demand from people that just want to go out and have fun again? Like, what's your thoughts on what's going on in the world? I'm, I'm dying to get back out there on a regular basis. I mean, I love performing three, four nights a week. Mm -hmm. I have no problem doing that. I love it that much. I never get tired of it. I do have a genuine fear that once, once we, you know, as citizens, as human beings, once we see that numbers are going down, we may have a tendency to get back out and get a little too comfortable, yep. right? So there's always a threat of a resurgence. And that definitely is like sort of like a hidden fear of mine mm -hmm. that I do have. As much as I want to be back out there, I am somewhat guarded mm -hmm. and, and, and cautious, you know? I mean, I have elderly parents. I, I would never want to bring something home and, and have them, right. you know, catch something. Um, but I do have every confidence that we are going to bounce back that this thing's gonna go away eventually, I'm gonna get a handle on it. And people are definitely raring to go and get back out there and live normal lives and enjoy live entertainment. Yes. Because man, it's like without it, it's nothing. life is different. It totally is. The life stinks without live entertainment. I'm biased of course, but even if I couldn't sing, I would be craving some kind of, kind of live entertainment that I could go out and enjoy and listen to, take a date, you know, whatever. Live entertainment is like, to me, it's it's really what I live for. I love the '80s rock bands. Still, these guys are in their late fifties. Yep, they're still performing. Mm -hmm. You go to the show for twenty bucks, right? And it's a night. It's a memory. It's an experience. Exactly. It's not like going to Mohegan or TD Garden. You see Bon Jovi. You spend five hundred bucks. Right. You're shuffled in with fifteen dollar beers. Like I don't like that. I don't need live that. entertainment. I like a venue that's intimate, that's small, mm -hmm. maybe like the size of Lupo's at most. Yep. What's your favorite type of place or venue to perform? If, to, you, if you have your, your pick. To perform? I like a, a nice, intimate restaurant, you know, with a cool lounge, with a cool dining mm -hmm. restaurant area, kind of a mix. Um, I like that because I don't have to belt I can sing, right. you know, real mellow, mm -hmm. laid back. Joke with the audience. Right. Say hello to your friends. Exactly. People are close enough mm -hmm. where I can shake someone's hand, sing, without being like like a lounge lizard and walking around and shaking people's hands. <laughs> People get creeped out. I get kind of creeped out by that too myself. You know? What's a lounge lizard? Just, just a, <laughs> a guy or a girl who just kind of like, you know, creeps around through the lounge and goes up to tables and sings. And I don't wow. knock it. If that works for you, it's just not my thing. Got it. I like to be stationary. Mm -hmm. And if someone's out in the audience and enjoying what I'm doing and loving what I'm doing, I can make eye contact and have like a moment, a connection. Yep. Um, and if not, if people are just focused on their conversation at a table, that's fine too. You know, but if someone looks up and, oh, I love this song and they sing along and they clap, it's like a bonus. Yes. But I do it because I love it for myself in the first place. And then, like I said, like it's just kind of like an, an added bonus when someone enjoys it. It's kind of like you're fishing. Kind of like you're you're singing fishing. out in the restaurant, and then you you got one on right the table nine. <laughs> right. It's a good analogy. <laughs> it's a real good analogy. And I like that about you. You're very you. You also keep your voice lower if it's like a dinner time or Always. people get their meals or slower songs, and then you'll pick it up right. as the night goes on. So you're exactly. very aware socially. 
And as a respect thing for the people who are in the audience, I always ask, is the volume okay? Yes. Can I adjust it any way you like it? You know, kind of like that. And what about folks, right? People that you've worked for. What's some of the worst experiences that you've had? So the worst experience with that either a guest or a client, right, right. With, with any entertainer, I think the worst experience that one could have is when the check ain't ready, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like when you're supposed to be compensated that night for services rendered, yep. um, especially for a private event mm -hmm. where there's a contract involved, they ask you for the contract, email me the contract yep. and then they're on you. I didn't get the contract yet. It's three days. Where's the contract? And in the contract, it specifically states um, payment must be made prior to the start of your event. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, clients, when you get a contract, here we go. When you sign it, don't just get the contract, open up the envelope, and sign it and mail it back. Read the contract. Mm -hmm. Read the bullet points because there's a bullet point in my contract for inclement weather. Mm -hmm. If it's going to rain, will you provide the artist with? adequate shelter mm -hmm. because we have expensive equipment mm -hmm. that requires electricity so there's danger involved mm -hmm. you know there's liability with the value of the equipment um and uh that other bullet point which is is one of the most important ones to have payment ready prior to the start of the engagement because when i'm finished rendering my services at your event that's typically you know when payment is made mm -hmm. even if the, if, the, if the contract says to pay me before I start, even if they wait until after I'm done and I get paid, that's fine. I kind of equate it to when you go out to dinner in a restaurant, mm -hmm. right? You get served, you have your meal, your drinks, etc. Bill comes, pay the bill. You don't say, oh, you know what? <laughs> I left my debit card at home. I'm going to mail you a check. Right. <laughs> to me, there's, there's, it's, it's no difference. Mm -hmm. It's still a business. Services were provided. Just, you know, compensate the service provider. So that's probably the worst Upon experience. commencement. Exactly. That's what Michael Mancini's contract used to say. Yes. He two. would say, get the deposit, <laughs> right. step one. And number two is either, he would say, two weeks prior to the event. That's right. Paid in full. If not, upon commencement, once we were there. Exactly. And then folks would wait till the end of the event and then say, oh, um... Wait, how much was it? Or do you think I could meet you tomorrow at the Duncan? And it's like, mm. I I remember the feeling of just like, that is so dirty. It's dirty, man. It's very dirty. And one of the worst things that I remember is we were doing a pool party, a 40th birthday. Uh, the woman got very intoxicated. Okay, The birthday girl? The birthday girl. Okay. She was having her birthday fun, which was cool. No yeah. problem. Me and Michael... We're to go to 8 p.m. And then she said, keep going. And we haven't been paid yet. So we went till 11. Oh my gosh. Three hours and we, you know, overtime. Of course. Extra. Yeah. And then at 11.15, Michael said, all right, great. Let's shut it down. Right. So we just shut it down. We stopped playing and you start to hear, oh, where'd the music go? Like people started chirping and me and Michael are like. What do you want from me? What do you want from me? She ended up not paying us. A guest that was where there paid us. No way. So she didn't pay you like at all. The be not a dime. She was too unaware to even know where she was. Like never mind the overtime. She never paid the initial fee. Wow. So what do you tell your students about all the kind of stimulus that they get? About all the influence and stuff on TV, stuff on the radio. How do you keep them grounded? When maybe they like that stuff and they think you're the one that's out of touch or you're mm -hmm. the one that doesn't get it or you're the old guy. Right. How do you kind of let them know that a lot of the stuff they see is not healthy and it's not true? What I tell them is that it, it's entertainment. The, you know, rappers, singers, actors, models, they're putting on a show. It's made up. You know, different entertainers who talk about shooting each other or you know doing nefarious criminal activities a lot of it is for entertainment purposes and posturing it's putting on an act i mean if if they were really talking about shooting one another then the majority of, of people who rap about these things would be in jail 
There'd be no music. <laughs> There'd be none. So a lot of it has to be an act of posturing. What I tell kids who aspire to be hip hop artists, professional athletes, professional entertainers, I say, great. I, I have every confidence that you have what it takes and that you can pursue that, give it your best shot. However, I mean, obviously not everyone has what it takes to be a professional, any one of those things. Keep that, keep it in mind that you have to also have something to fall back on. I hope you become an NBA star. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't work out, what do you plan to do as a backup? Consider going to a community college and getting a, a bachelor's degree. I mean, uh, an associate's degree, rather. Mm -hmm. Consider it something that you love that's a little bit more, quote unquote, uh, down to earth, regular. Think about maybe being a teacher. Think about law school, perhaps. Think about being a drug counselor, a social worker, getting into real estate. Think about like the, what I call the long game. Think about yep. something that you love, yep. that you can invest in and invest in yourself to learn and to master. Because what a lot of these kids have on their, what they all have on their side, which none of us ever realized at the time, what they have is youth, mm. right? I mean, what would you give to go back and be 10, even 10 years old yeah. again, 15 years old again. It's that blank slate, that energy, that yes. everything. They've got so much time ahead of them. And if they just stopped and thought realistically and said, let me see what successful people around my community are doing, wealthy people around my community are doing, that, that I could do as well. Let me find a mentor who can sort of take me under their wing and teach me habits and skills that I could monetize and, and build a little empire with and mm -hmm. build some generational wealth and, and set myself up so that maybe they could retire when they turn 40 or 50. Instead of, you know, aspiring to be a hotshot entertainer, rapper, whatever the case may be, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I fully support people you know, pursuing their dreams. Go for that. But have that backup plan True. just in case just to be a little bit more realistic. You took my last question <laughs> and you completely knocked it out of the park. I was gonna ask you, I said, what advice would you give to folks that are coming up? And wow. you just nailed it on the head. Great. So we got a couple extra minutes so I can freestyle a little bit. Let's do it. And I wanna know your favorite pizza. My favorite in pizza? In Rhode Island. Oh my God, my favorite pizza spot? Yes. Whew. That's a great question. So I've, I've got a couple. You gotta pick one. Though. I gotta pick one. One pizza. And why? But Lord have mercy. It's going on Facebook? This is going. I know a lot of There's gonna be a lot pizza of pizza pies out there. Pizza pies based on this answer. But you're gonna have one that loves you. You know, I, I don't eat carbs anymore, man. I don't, uh... But when you did, <laughs> you're not getting away. So this, this goes back to my youth. So when I was a kid, uh, we were big Tommy's Pizza people, so Tommy's Pizza is uh, is is hands down my favorite. Okay. Tommy's, and that's right over here on Chalkstone. On Chalkstone, yeah, still there. When I was in eighth grade, my my brother and my friends and I we used to walk to the Castle Theater, which is now Federal Hill Pizza. What's up, Billy Manzo? And we'd see a movie at the Castle, and then we'd walk to Tommy's Pizza and play music on the jukebox. Dream on, I think Aerosmith was like a staple. So Tommy's Pizza has like a real nostalgic yeah. kind of connection. And it's still there, it hasn't changed? It's still there, has not changed. And what about restaurant? If you're going to go sit down and have something nice, what's your favorite restaurant? My favorite restaurant to sit down and eat in because it's a nice drive, it's a beautiful atmosphere. Um, I would say it's uh, my 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 good pal Jerry Longo's Pizzeria, Pizzeria Longo wow. in Westerly. Never heard of it. Yeah, man. You gotta Where take it right there. Where about in Westerly? Is it towards the beach or downtown? It's, um, it's more downtown. Okay. It's, you know where the train station is on mm -hmm. Canal Street? Yep. It's right around the corner. Jerry used to own a restaurant called uh, Trattoria Longo, um, and then he opened a pizzeria. He decided to close the Trattoria, focus on the uh, pizzeria around the corner. Beautiful, you know, Brick pizza oven, um, beautiful bar, 
huge selection of wines, cocktails, mm -hmm. all Italian, great Italian food. Have you ever performed there? I used to perform at an Italian restaurant. Okay. In fact, he opened up his restaurant in Dover Downs, which is in Delaware, to okay. a casino. Yep. And he actually hired me to perform there once a month before the pandemic hit. So hopefully I'll be back there again. But I want to say hello to my good pal, Jerry Longo. What's up, cuz? Hope to see you soon. Does Miss he you. know that? Does he know what? That you're his, that his restaurant is your favorite? I don't think he knows that. He knows now. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. And the last thing I want you to say is anything you want our audience to know. Anything that you want the world to know about Stevie P. Um, I want the world to know that I'm out here, I'm available, and I would love to connect with you for any private event that you may be having, uh, a wedding, an anniversary, a birthday, a cocktail reception, backyard barbecue, give me a call. And Gregory, how can they get in touch with you? So uh, you can reach me at um, stephenpalumbo.com, www.stephenpalumbo.com. My email address is stp912 mm -hmm. at gmail.com. And my Instagram is stephen underscore tp, which is stephen with a V underscore TP and uh, you can find me on Facebook as well so once again we're here in Providence Rhode Island with Stephen Palumbo yes sir Greg from Nexus your property managed